A lot of people look at your lectures and they say the same thing. Sheikh Mufti Menk is funny. He says jokes a lot. Some people love it. Some people don't know how to look at it. And some people, they're a bit sarcastic about it. They might hate it. They might hate it. Yeah. Tell us, Sheikh. Why do you <laughs> say jokes in your lectures? That's an amazing question. I tell you something. When I was young, we grew up uh, with a lot of fear of uh, the sh scholars, the imams in the masjid. There was a distance, even though my father, an imam and a scholar and a mentor, but very strict. And initially, it was so difficult to communicate. I saw a clear, clear gap between the scholars and the masses. And wherever I went at the time, I always saw that gap. Uh, and I always told myself that I'd like to bridge this gap. There needs to be something. You know, we scholars are looked at as harsh people who never smile. They're always attacking people. You know what? You've got to say a thing or two, especially for the newer generations. And I think I'm probably similar to you in age, if not maybe a little bit older. Wallahu A little bit older, Sheikh. There we go. <laughs> so uh, what I want to say is, uh, if you know, as we grew up, it was very different. And... In fact, the world is becoming more and more filled with so much of difficulty, depression, hardship, anxiety. The last thing you want is the person calling you towards Allah doing the same thing to you. So I say, you know what, keep it light. And, you know, I'll still crack a joke, a little bit of wit, a little bit of banter now and again. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Mostly there is a lesson behind the there is a lesson behind whatever joke might have been cracked subhanallah mm. sometimes it, it it may be a big lesson and sometimes it's a smaller lesson but yeah that's that's uh, primarily the reason why I, I i joke you know break the ice uh, get the people to realize you know what this guy is calling me towards allah but he's doing it in a beautiful way i can understand i can relate i remember a thing or two they will listen to more things. The idea is not the joke. The idea is what lies beyond that joke. Mm. So if I spoke for 30 minutes and cracked two jokes, no. tell me what did I do for the other 25 minutes? I listen to a lot of your lectures, mashallah. You're Allah, explaining the concepts, Allah. the principles, and the joke is to draw them in, Allah. to make, keep it light hearted. Although that's an art, Ya Sheikh. A lot of people who don't do public speaking, yes. they don't understand this art. You and I understand this art. And uh, people pay big bucks to learn this art of how to engage the audience. Would you say most of your audience are young people? I think so. But I think I've cut across the, the, the age uh, divide. So I have old people, middle-aged people, young people, and very young, and children as well. In fact, I went into cartoons, I went into kids' content, I went into you know, teenage programs, and then we've been into a marriage and divorce, and then we went into... Uh, you know, taking care of parents, grandparents, and so on. So we've cut across the entire uh, age spectrum. Allah, Sheikh, I've seen it. I've seen kids approach you, giving you high fives, Allah. fist pumps. And we give it back to them. So you've got to speak to everyone on their level. Haddithun nasa ala qadri uquulihim aw bima ya'rifun. No. I try my best to speak to everyone as per that advice that you know everyone on their level so if there is someone generally practicing uh, they may not appreciate that we're actually uh, aiming at the, the vast majority who are struggling to practice or not practicing or sometimes not even Muslim and a lot of people don't realize that you know those who are hardcore and they are very practicing firstly I don't expect them to listen to me. Mm. And if they do, I know that they just listen to a little snippet. A lot of the times they wouldn't understand what you've done. Mm. I studied in Medina Munawara in 1991 onwards uh, for a few years. And I can tell you that I was also very hard initially uh, and rigid with what I learned and the way I wanted to do things. But when I got home, my father told me, sit and watch the people for a whole year don't go out and start talking to them until you see them for one whole year so for a whole year i was just sitting and watching teaching little children alif and ba at, the, at this madrasa and it was very humbling because i was bubbling and bursting with a lot and ended up teaching at a madrasa adjacent to the masjid i was leading the salawat uh, barely ever spoke to anyone and mm. so on and then by the time i opened my mouth i was already calm 
I already saw that, you know, you're trying to bring people into an ideal situation and we're living in a non-ideal world. Mm -hmm. So it's really uh, a, a beautiful experience to have had someone uh, who's an expert in addressing people uh, discipline you and your own wishes at the same time bringing the two together. Yeah. Well, I'm Sheikh, um, similar to, to you when I first started about maybe 26, 27 years ago. Similar, mashallah. Very similar. I was pretty fiery. Yes. And as time went on, you kind of ease up a little bit. You change your approach as you know the people. Yes, so people say you watered down, watered down. We've never watered down. We've just changed approach. And yes, there may be certain things, certain things that we might be more accommodating regarding because of how we've learned about evidences of difference of opinion that we did not know before. Mm. And we are bound by evidence. No. So if someone shows me an uh, evidence to prove a certain uh, rule or ruling, uh, I will acknowledge it, even if I feel that it may not be the most correct, but it ha there is a scope of it being correct, leave it be. It doesn't mean that what I always said is the absolute truth, no. when there is evidence otherwise. And this is the reason why we have ikhtilaf among the Sahaba, among the Tabi'een, among uh, the Imma, among the scholars. It's okay for as long as it's within a certain scope. So we, I know that over the years we face criticism from people who are not experts in the field of da'wah. Or they may be uh, very, very knowledgeable and we look up to them in a way, but they don't know the, the field you are working in. Yeah. You know? I think I can relate with you. With that. I, I was raised in Australia, in the West, yourself, Sheikh. In but Africa, basically. Africa, and you, you've traveled the world, yes. and you understand. Yes. The more you meet the people, you do realize that the approach and the language that you have to use with them uh, has to resonate. Definitely. Some people don't understand that language, subhanAllah. I sat with you, Sheikh, many times. And we oh, went wow. through the whole aqidah. And I find that your aqidah is from, mashallah, it's sound and, and safe. Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah, alhamdulillah. May Allah Almighty grant us all acceptance. You know, and, and I've sat with you many times. And uh, I, just for interest's sake, I first got to know you from Brother Azad in Sri Lanka. Uh, I do remember that time. Yes. And he told me Bilal Asad, And I said, who's that? He said, he's someone from Australia. And I knew that, well, if he relates to this person, it means he must be someone and then I heard some of your lectures back in the day when you used to wear cotton uh, Turkish style kufi on your head. Ah uh, yes I wore that yes. like uh, yes like your one? No the, 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 the one made of like cotton you know. The cotton woven. One. Yes woven. Ah and, yes, and yes, it was yes. Only, and I saw this young guy you know strong looking and this the speech was always uh, correct in the sense that I agreed with it. Oh mashallah you know mashallah I said okay this is a good guy and I, I always have an eye for people who are uh, beautiful in their approach and don't compromise but still they are understanding and accommodating of different temperaments of different types of people and they don't just bash everyone so I have an eye for those people and I found quite a lot and mashallah they're like-minded uh, in a great sense and uh, I, that's why we enjoy the interactions mm, you know Sheikh because I'll tell you what some people when they listen to someone else they take things literally and others they know how to read between the lines. They understand what this person is actually saying. And I've listened to you very carefully and found that, subhanAllah, I understand what Mufti Menk is doing here. You're saying something in a way where other people can take it and then you'll build on it afterwards and then third time and then fourth time and help the people go step by step because as we say, بَشِّرُ وَلَا تُنَفِّرُ يَسِّرُ وَلَا تُعَسِّرُ as Prophet exactly. said, give good news and, and glad tidings, don't give bad news all the time and negativity and give, uh, make people happy, don't make them sad um, and sometimes we may say something and people may take that completely out of context say no, you meant that and sometimes I look and say no I didn't mean that subhanAllah you should understand what I'm trying to do with these yes. people we live in a time where young people are suffocating, they're drowning and unity is very, very important between us. We have to work together. I mean, that's why I'm here in the UK with you wow. and wow. Sheikh Omar Suleiman, Sheikh Abu Bakr Zod and the rest, Sheikh Wa'il. And people are so excited to see how we're together. Because people wow. are, why do you think, Sheikh? Why do you think people, we had so many comments in our hugs, for example, that we put on, on Instagram. Why do you think people are so happy to see this unity in this brotherhood? Simple reason. Tell us. 
there is too much of the opposite out there. It's unbelievable to see this happening when everyone is just bickering, fighting, squabbling. You know, it's a war out there between not just scholars, but even general Muslims. You know, people, I mean, there are two things, a few things. One is this Qadiyya al Palestiniya, which is our Qadiyya. Yeah. This whole Palestine thing is, is our problem, it's our issue, right? And we take it seriously. And the way that the infighting amongst the people, just pointing fingers at you did and you didn't do and you're not doing and you're doing and you're not doing and you're supposed to be doing, that itself is already a show of frustration. Mm. So I excuse people and I was saying people don't know what we've done and they haven't listened to the lectures. They say you've never spoken, you've never done. I, I have and what am I supposed to do? Answer you back to say no I have or no. If you haven't heard it, remember it's not my problem. And another thing is there are other things that I have done that you cannot do. Yes. I, I don't tell you you didn't do this, you did because I know it's not in your capacity. It's okay. It's a big responsibility. You have to understand the people you're talking to as well. Yes. I've sat with you a lot, Shaykh. Wow. And uh, I know, alhamdulillah, Allah that Allah. you call to the Kitab and the Sunnah. Allahumma lak alham. May Allah make it that way. We're open to correction. No. We're open to correction. And we always correct each other. Yes, yes it's true. We do. And it's uh, name calling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us don't call each other names. Advise one another, wanting the best for your brothers. This is how we have to work together. Wallahi, I love all my brothers and sisters, even those who possibly will say do the things. wrong thing and say the bad things. We want the best for each other. Yes, that's how Rasulullah yes, that's that's was. It, feel, al -Habib. it feels like a letdown sometimes. It feels like a letdown, but at the end of the day, we want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely. Absolutely. And oh. our ham and our worry is the ummah, the community, these young people who are just searching for any identity. And Sheikh, something really that always uh, makes me extremely happy. When I was back in the days when I was a kid, you go into a masjid, people were over 40, hardly any children. Whenever they see a sheikh, oh, he's just a sheikh, doesn't know what's going on, they walk away from them. Do you see now, uh, even children as young as seven years old see a sheikh and they look at them as if they are superstars, they're, they're a soccer player that's just hopped out, you know, playing for a big team or something. Uh, do you see this, this difference, subhanAllah? Why do you think this is the case at the moment? I think it's because there's a lot of work that has, uh, uh, an effort that has been put in to creating that type of an environment. Mm. I mean, I remember a time, and I'm sure you, do, you, you are a vehicle of it, knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, I remember a time when the approach changed, and there are a lot of people who came in with a softer approach. They have netted in many more people than before. And this is why I say earlier and I said I pity those who are so harsh and hard they don't realize they're catering for a small niche. No. But we live in the Western world where the real life issues that are being faced by the people need to be taken into consideration when you're talking to them. Mm. We have little kids who are being bombarded with all sorts of things from a young age in their syllabuses in the schools in some countries mm. and then you expect them to listen to you and you're going to bombard them from another angle. You need to show them with love, talk to them, smile at them, uh, be humble, cater for, for them. I remember when I went into cartoons at one stage, the people were refuting and saying all sorts of things. I just looked down, kept on doing my work. Uh, they don't know. One day they will be in it. And now many people are joining and many people are in it. They've realized that if you do a little study as to the consumption of cartoon uh, material of Muslim children, you'll be shocked. Nearly every child is somehow connected to it. What Islamic content do you have? it is less than 2% today, less yes. than 2%. Is it not your duty as a leader to cater for them, to make content for them? If no one wants to do it, you do it. And you know what? It will go very, very far because from that little age, you've already created in them an interest in a person who's religious, Imam of the Masjid, Salah, the Duas, so many more things. People are using that to literally to to fulfill their agendas. Ours is the deen of Allah that we need to serve. No. So some people don't see the light in it. They say, no, it's haram, you can't do this. That. Okay, you know, you do your thing, let's do our thing. But the sad part is they begin to attack and block and hinder without understanding we're catering for your children and grandchildren. No. But it's okay. Sheikh, I've been in education as a teacher 
for 17 years in one school and another three years at another, nearly 20 years. And you yourself was, yes. have been a teacher, so we understand from the perspective of education. And when it comes to education, you've got to understand the minds of these young people. So we can, we can tell you have to be creative and innovative. And I remember listening to Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, rahmatullah uh, alayhi. He was a bit open-minded because he, he listened to the different mindsets of people and knew that, hold on a minute, it's not just Saudi, that the whole world is a little bit different in different cultures. And when social media first came out, he was one of the first to say, you need to go, go in and beat the traffic into social media. You can't let the others go in and play with the minds of our youth. You this need was to go in and take before, it over. Yeah, slightly before the, you know, the revolution of social media. He had already said that, yes. I'm just taking it as he's telling us, yes. be, go into the creativity. Yes. And wherever it is, and you take it over because you've got to reach the minds of these I'll give you a quick example, mm. if you don't mind. Tabba. Recently, the controversy of sisters wearing an abaya, are they allowed to wear a coat on top of that abaya? So, a debate, and people said haram, and they said whatever they said. And like a coat, like this one? A coat like that one on top of the abaya, basically. No. And something bigger. So, if you look at the answers of the scholars, now I have my approach, my way of dealing with it, trying to... Uh, accommodate the 95% of the Muslims who are not very practicing. I, I mean, I, when I tell you 95%, I, I really mean it. They may be practicing, but they're not, they're not there yet. And from among them, perhaps more than half are, are, are not even in a place of that which we would say is, is like, you know, breaking even. Mm. So we're talking to masses who are facing challenges, who have, who have not yet even worn proper hijab. They haven't even gotten a cloak yet. They haven't. So it depends who you're addressing. And you have to take into consideration the effort they've made to get to where they are before you open your mouth to talk about where they should be, which is correct to say, okay, they should be somewhere. But how are we going to address this matter? Have you seen the improvement? And then you get a cloak on. And mashallah, that's a massive achievement. Do you acknowledge it? If you're in the field of da'wah and you're a murabbi and you're a person who, you know, helps people come up, you would realize that to appreciate where they've gotten to from where they were is something very important. Now, you look at Sheikh Uthman Khamis, for example. Now, uh, in his uh, words, when he was asked exactly the same question, he said, it's better to have, you know, the cloak. Uh, but you have to take into consideration where you are, uh, the weather of the place you're in. You have to take into consideration the orf of the place that you're in and so on. Orf as in the customs of the, the customs people. of no. the people and so So if you're talking to someone in Britain, in Scandinavia, in Greenland, in Alaska, in North America, in these freezing conditions where they have to put on a coat, you know, mm. how would you tackle the matter? I mean, uh -huh. where he is telling you it is permissible. Mm. And I wouldn't, I mean, I didn't quote him, but I know. And I didn't uh, say that, oh, this is haram and this is like halal, but we're giving a general ruling to say, cover yourselves in an appropriate manner, uh, do it for the sake of Allah, and try and get better and better as time passes. No. That is a far better approach than the one who comes in, hacks down 90% of the ummah, and moves forward thinking, I did a service to the deen of Allah. Mm. They don't have any expertise in the da'wah. Another thing, I would, I would excuse those who live in very hot temperatures, thinking that I'm just putting on a coat for fashion, you know? It's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And they don't, no one told them it's freezing ice cold, we need to put on a coat. I mean, obviously, if something is showing the shape of your body, we have a different issue. We're going to have to deal with that and tackle it for them to get to the ideal. Mm. But the thing here is, when the vast majority don't even have that initial cloak that you're talking about, how do you address it? So, when I addressed it, you know, in my own way, uh, trying to acknowledge what exactly the people had, uh, you know, or we're talking about and, and getting to a place of acknowledgement of their progress. You find all sorts of people say all sorts of things, but 95% of the people will appreciate what you said because they have real struggles. 
Sheikh, I heard that lecture. And what I heard, Allahu Akbar. what I heard okay. was this. What I heard from you, you're trying to say yes, yes. to our sisters. Sisters, now I'm paraphrasing and understanding what, what you're you trying to say. What you understood from what I yes, said. Yes, exactly. Being born in the West, obviously I studied overseas and East and West, understanding what's happening in the Dawah field and how sisters are being approached about their deen and their covering and all of that. What I heard Mufti Meng saying is, sisters, hijab is fard. We all know that. And I know that you love the Quran and you want to follow Islam. And that you will hear so many different approaches from different people on the internet. And I know that it's making you move away because the approach of a lot of these men is harsh to you. So I want to take this with wisdom. I want you to work slowly, step by step, and inshallah improve on yourself. As for those who are talking too much, if it's affecting you, don't listen to them. What matters to you is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So long as Allah is pleased with you, then you think about that and do that. As for the people, if it's affecting you to move away, no, don't listen to them. But listen to what Allah is saying and ignore the other people's words if they are hurting you and making you move away. This, يعني, as Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawaidati al Call to the path of your Lord with wisdom and with goodly advice. This is what I heard from you. But not everybody can hear that I unless you understand the people. One problem also that we're facing, I thought of it while you were talking, is uh, the new clips that you have on social media. Mm sometimes do not cover the the topic so it's a little bite of what you said a few seconds 30 seconds a minute sometimes two minutes Important so, point so the people who are refuting you they write uh, you know they publish articles they write page upon page book upon book against a clip <coughs> claiming that you said this but they didn't bother or make an effort to go and listen to the entire talk where it was delivered who were being addressed and what was the entire context if they bothered to listen to the 20 30 minutes they would appreciate if they had a clean heart unfortunately today you have these uh, guys who hold a phd in refutations mm. and what they do is they sit they listen to a clip and they create content in order to whatever I pity them again because they're not experts in the da'wah. They haven't really achieved much besides refuting others. Mm. And then the, the, the worst part is they'll take a clip of someone who might have said, oh, this is how it should be from one of the scholars. And they say, oh, this guy is like this and that guy. They wasted their whole life talking about someone else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never make us from that party. Sheikh, all oh my teachers, scholars and mashayikh, when they talk about advising someone, they always say, advise them. And find out, first of all, the full picture. And you don't advise them in public or do things in a way where you draw the attention to yourself. The idea is to love for your brother what you love for yourself. And ad din al-munasaha, din is about advising. You've got to advise in a wisdom and a way that works. In a way that keeps the dignity of your brother as well. And in a way that you are assisting the da'wah that it's going to work. Now, uh, you mentioned something amazing, and that's about TikTok, and that annoys me, subhanAllah, several times, whether it's Muslims or non-Muslims, they'll listen to a little tiny bit, you've got a clip which is about 30 seconds, they'll probably listen to two seconds of that, mm -hmm. and then make a comment, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask people what they, what they write. I made one, for example, uh, once about uh, the, 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 what men like in women, what me, women like in men, and someone had put only half of it, what men like in, in women. Immediately, you see the people, what about the women? What about this? What about that? And you see, well, have you listened to the whole thing yet? Or anything? So, any, uh, I think, Absolutely. Absolutely. and uh, make sure you read and clarify and verify the full picture before we jump to conclusions. So uh, many times I feel like commenting and you know, the, the, the uh, qualities we have make us stay away from commenting because it's okay, excuse them. I don't want to become ugly because of your ugliness. I just mm. leave it. But so many times I'm tempted to say something, just leave it. SubhanAllah. Shaykhna, in uh, the field of da'wah, you've 
been speaking to a lot of youth as soon as they see you they love to come and sit with you you wow. have this thing called the qabul people accepting you may Allah grant that Alhamdulillah. to us may Allah ask Allah to make you as Ameen. we assume of you and Ameen. even better Ameen. what do you think the youth this, these days are yearning for the most what do you think they're lacking you know a lot of what is happening in the world today politically and the crises the wars the challenges the famine the disasters a lot of this is making people realize the importance of their connection with Allah no. it's making the non-muslims come towards what they what is the truth you know uh, it's making uh, the Muslims realize that they need to come closer and closer to Allah and so at this moment we have the greatest opportunity to address this matter to to help the youth they are desperately in need of a breath of fresh air with that guidance so those who are uh, you know uh, causing a, a an issue or a disservice to islam are the ones who, who are doing all the bickering and all the pointing and all the hurtful abuse and so on because they are just chasing the people who are looking for a breath of fresh air away but the others who encourage them and who are uh, motivating them and trying to fill that gap those are the ones who are allah is using to do the good job so i believe we should just occupy ourselves in serving the needs of the Ummah. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I've been addressing a major problem that there is in uh, our circles, in, in the Ummah basically, and that is that of unmarried women who are looking for spouses. Mm. It might sound random, but it is bigger than you think it is. If you take a careful look and you have in your circles a little bit of an eye on this matter and this problem, you would realize how big it is. Who is tr speaking to divorced women, widows, those who might have an, a problem get, trying to get married and helping them to actually do that? Mm. Wallahi, it's a crisis. Wallahi, it's a crisis. Is a crisis single especially among the, the sisters mm. it is among some brothers as well but among no. the sisters it's more of concern and then the families make it difficult and they set the bar so high and it becomes difficult and oh, wallahi that's that's a major thing i i think that we sometimes don't address this matter enough mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know talk about the, the widows who are struggling talk about the the those who are divorced, sometimes they're divorced, obviously it doesn't make them bad. Sometimes that was the only thing that they could have gone through. I mean, uh, yes, every, every single divorce has its own uh, reasoning and so on, but I'm talking generally, we help these people up. That's just one crisis in the Ummah. We have so many more. We have those who are disabled, those who are challenged, those who are, uh, you know, disadvantaged in one way or another. Instead of sitting and refuting people, do something. You know, why don't you start up something to cater for people who, who are disadvantaged, people who have uh, some form of problem. You help them in the problem, but no, some people just choose, sit back, I don't want to work, and I don't want people who are working to work either. I'm going to attack them, and I'm just going to sit and chill. Mm. It's a different thing if you're doing a humongous job, you know, and then you want to say, brother, what you're doing is wrong. I don't condone that, but maybe you're doing a better job, but you're no. not even doing a job. You don't even know how to do the job. It's like a guy sitting back and telling the mechanic, you know what, you don't know how to repair the car, but he doesn't know a thing. He doesn't mm. even know how to lift a spanner. Mm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for the ummah. I remember a good sheikh who I know about once met, Sheikh Kishk. If you ever heard of Sheikh yes, Kishk, Allah yes, yes, from Egypt. And Sheikh Kishk had said something and uh, this sheikh said to him, it was still new, he said, what you said is wrong and it's weak hadith and so on. And the sheikh said to him something important, he said, Ta'allam qabla an tunkir. Go and learn first of all and gain this knowledge, understand the whole area before you oppose. And truly he went. And knowledge is not just knowledge, we, this is wisdom and understanding people as you've been doing, sheikh. Sheikh, you know, I've been in the school system for a very long time, as I said before. And uh, I see that young people have an identity crisis. And I see that those who have identity crisis, there's dysfunctional families, the relationship between the father and mother and the children, 
the involvement in children's lives, the communication. Sometimes, if I see, a, for example, a student reach year 11 and still they're asking me about istinja or they're asking me about ghusl, boys and girls, I wonder to myself, where is the communication relationship with their parents? You mentioned before that singlehood and marriage is a problem because parents are not helping much. I once heard a really good lecture from you, Sheikh, and it resonated with a lot of young people, advising the parents in how to allow their children to open up and talk about these matters. What do you advise the parents? How should they communicate with their parents about this? Do you do advise them to open up topics about sexuality, for example, and marriage, or love, or liking? Firstly, I believe that as parents, we must invest in our children. If we don't invest, why did we have those children? So number one is time. Even if you're just around, the fact that you're there. Number two is to try to communicate, to be there to help them, to play with them, to show them, to guide them, communicate. It wouldn't be easy for me to say, speak to them about these taboo topics that in today's world, I have to say you must speak to them about it or get someone to talk to them about it because they will definitely get it from somewhere else in the wrong narrative. Mm -hmm. And in order to avoid that, you are going to need to address this matter. I try to speak about these things with a little bit of ease. You just throw it in as though it's okay. Because trust me, the children of today know much more than you think they know when they're only five years old. They pretend like they know nothing. Mm. They've heard about everything that we only learned when we were 15. And they can give you the details of it. Mm. And the embarrassing details, they can just rattle it out to you to say, no, don't try and fool me. You know? So we look like fools to them when we're trying to duck and dive. Don't do that. Get into the topic. Talk to them. It doesn't have to be uh, so deep and so often, but they just need to know my dad spoke to me about this or mom spoke to me, depending on how you want to set it up in your own home, male to female or whatever. Mm. And uh, for as long as they know, when they have an issue, you are the first go-to. Many parents, the children are f so frightened of them, even in the modern world, even in the Western countries, that when they have an issue, the parent is the last person they would go to. They tell us, please don't mention this. I want anonymity. I don't want you. I can speak to your parent, I would say. They would say, no, please don't do that. You'd break me. You'd do this. You know, it's going to, my father's going to kill me, whatever they say. So... I wonder that, you know, Allah is going to ask you, Kullukum ra'in, kullukum mas'ulun ar ra'iyati. You're all shepherds, you're all responsible for your flock. Here's your flock running away from you, scared of you, frightened of you. How could you do that? You know, when you have, that example is so perfect about the flock, that mm. if there are sheep, one sheep is going away, uh, you, you know, you should be having sleepless nights, but bring it in, feed them, be with them, you know, uh, no matter what. Uh, so I, I always uh, go out of my way mm. to greet the young and then the, the teenagers even the little children if you ever watch me carefully mm. I would go out of my way to give them time because uh, my son as he grew up one of my sons as yeah. he grew up he used to say I don't want to come there I said but why come with me he says you know what I'm like non-existent they're, they're, and, and these are sheikhs sometimes that they interact with and the youngsters saying, you know what, <laughs> they, they just ignored me like I wasn't even there. <laughs> In my mind I'm thinking, but you're just a child. But then yeah. I think, let me tell some of my colleagues, you know what, give these kids a bit of importance. Yes. Greet them. That's the only thing they want from you. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, it could change their lives because they've looked up to you. That's one of the reasons why when someone says, Sheikh, can I have a photo with you? I try not to deny it. I know mm. it's very difficult. I know sometimes you have to make a plan, you know, you have someone. And look, it, it, it may not be ideal, but sometimes you have uh, a woman there. Uh, you know, it, I have certain rules and regulations. Like I said, it may not be ideal. There could be people saying, no, you're Sheikh, you shouldn't even be doing that at all. But look, when someone's really been impacted by you all their lives, so many things have changed. One day they suddenly see you. In today's orf, in today's, they want to capture the moment, nothing more. Mm. It's captured. There's no khalwa, meaning there's no seclusion. You're not with them alone. There's, it's in full view of the public. Everyone is there. And they want to, be ha to, to have the opportunity to say, you know what, I actually met this person who's my teacher, who taught me knowingly, unknowingly for decades or for a long time. 
I think to deny them that would probably be more uh, difficult for them to digest at times mm. than to say, okay, you know what, th there's a table between us, there's a few other people here, there's so much here, you can take a quick picture and move on, you know? And what, what's the quick picture all about? It is capturing the real life moment that did occur. Mm. It's not like I'm doing something absurd. This thing happened in full view of the whole public, mm. you know? And if I pass someone in the aisle in the supermarket and they, uh, people happen to capture it without us knowing at times, a lot of the times. What if I just knew and, 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 I, and I just turned around and said, oh, salam alaikum, you know? I mean, people come to me and say, can you do a video for my brother? Can you do one for my sister? Just to say salam. Why are they saying that? Because that person looks up to you. You're gonna mm. say, no, 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 haram. Okay, fair enough. You might not want to do it, but if you consider where I'm coming from, you would say, well, if they would really be moved by a little video of me making salam with someone, what does it cost you? Mm. You know, to, 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 to instill happiness in the heart of a mu'min, that's one. But another one is to be able to say a word that might help them and encourage them in the right direction. It's not going to do any harm to them. Mm. So, like are you looking say, at from Bab al Maslaha al Mafsad, are you looking at the benefit verse? Uh, yes, harm. and like I said, this mm. is not a religious ruling that that has to be this way or that way. You know, it's 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 open. I, I like I said earlier, I know there is an ideal. We're living in a non-ideal world. Mm. We mm. have people out there who are struggling. That, and it has had such impact on people's lives. Today, there was a youngster, a little boy, I think about seven years old. Wallahi, he came up to me at the restaurant where we, we went for some some desserts. And he showed me, he said, you know, two years ago, I took a picture with you by the, by the car. And I saw myself sitting in a motor vehicle, little boy outside, and someone took a picture of us, whatever it was. His name was Yusuf. And he said, can I take a picture today? I said, no problem. Come, let's take another picture. Then you can update that one, you know. I mean, I, it takes time. It's very taxing. I wouldn't want to do it. You know, people say, you're doing it for name and fame. And I tell them, I'm already famous. I'm already famous. Mm. So what am I doing it for? Oh, yeah, Sheikh. Uh throwing accusations at someone about their heart. I mean, we know the story of the Sahabi, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ashaqaqta an qalbi, did you yeah. open up in his chest and look, look in, into, into it? Heart. He was in the battlefield, he was on the floor and said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, he killed mm -hmm. him, he said, he only said it out of anger, Ya Rasulullah, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. If you ask everyone in the world, it's pretty obvious. He oh, said, well. did you open up into his heart? Uh, this uh, problem of assuming, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, uh, Shaykh, I understand where you're coming from. Allah. And it is difficult. People who are in that scene, they do understand. People who are not, they're not able to understand. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open their hearts and minds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us on good always because the ummah is drowning, as I said. And we need to wake up and help them. Just get back onto the onto the, the land. The yani salat is lost, uh, the hijab is lost, the uh, identity is lost, physical identity, uh, uh, all sorts of identity wow. in every way, shape and form, subhanAllah. So I understand it's a very difficult road to maneuver through. We don't want to lose them, we don't want to delude them. We want to keep them somewhere and each person according to their uh, understanding. You know, I have a friend whose daughter, uh, one time, she was about six years old and I smiled to her. And I went here, one day he called me up and he said, you know what my little daughter said? She said, this is a month later, where is that man that smiles? Wow. She doesn't know my name, she doesn't know anything. Where is that man that smiles? The children remember that. Wow. And uh, this is also part of that, they see a frowning person all the time, they're going to say, hey, there we go, this is another religion of judgment and they always frown, they never smile, I might as well go to that celebrity and this celebrity and that soccer player and that footy player and that boxer player and that singer and that whatever, because they make me feel validated and make me feel important, they smile to me. We don't want to lose that youth in a time when, subhanAllah. So, Shaykh, Wallahi, I understand exactly where you're coming from. I have. Uh people from all walks of life and all faiths and a lot of people from across the board uh, coming and they actually have the courage and it, it doesn't even require courage but they actually have the courtesy to come and salam, salam alaikum shaykh, I've really benefited, I follow you, I watch you, I benefited from you and so on. And another thing very quickly is you know people who revert to Islam and they come as a result of the approach that you've used as a result of uh, them being able to relate to the way you've worded things. 
Alhamdulillah, they are in their thousands. Yeah. In their thousands. Mm -hmm. And so when I know that this has happened, it makes me ignore a guy who hasn't converted a single person talking about your method and the way you do things and so on. Like he is a big, great, successful daddy, you know. Mm. And he wants to quote this and quote that and so on. And I think to myself, they haven't studied and they don't know. They have blinkers, they haven't seen societies and perhaps they don't even know the role that the environment plays in shaping the methodology of dawah. Because mm. you and I know that the hikmah, the method, it, it all depends on your environment as well. No. The orf and the people around you and what's going on at the time and so on. So mashallah, when you see people coming into the faith and there comes a time when they would move on to some other mashayikh who go into different types of details, different disciplines, someone who might be a little bit stricter, who might come across with a little bit more uh, direct approaches and so on. And alhamdulillah, that's what we expect. Mm. I don't so expect I, you to stay in grade one and two forever. You need to mm, move on. Mm. But if you don't appreciate the primary school teacher, you're not going to appreciate anywhere else because you're not going to move on. Yes, I understand, Sheikh. Subhanallah. Remember back in Sri Lanka, just uh, yes. uh, when you mentioned uh, Brother Zahid uh, Azad in, in Sri Lanka. So he told me a lot about you. We were in an elevator and he said, you know, Mufti Mink, we would go into an elevator and a non-Muslim woman would just join us in the elevator. And he would go out of his way and say, how are you, madam? And this lady has never experienced something like that before, to see a man like this and say to her, I have a habit of saying, have a good day. Yes. Have a nice day. No matter who it is. Why, why do you do that, Chef? For them to have the first interactions, perhaps in their lives, with a guy who's a practicing Muslim bearded, robed person. That's mm. all. Let's break the ice. Let's let them know we're humans, we care for you. I didn't even talk about anything. It was just, have a good day, ma'am. Uh, you know, in, in a lift, it happens often. It happens on aircraft, it happens in public transport, it happens in planes, it happens. These interactions happen. I'm always, I'm always probably very conscious of my politeness. I love to be the most polite. And I tell myself, there should not be another person more polite than you. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> Allah so I go out of Allah. my way to be polite to anyone and everyone. Do you know what? Sheikh Bilal, it has, by the will of Allah, changed lives. Mm. It has brought people into the fold of Islam over a period of time. Just a little interaction. I've seen the results. So if you're going to try and tell me otherwise, I'm going to laugh at you. And that's one of the reasons why it doesn't bother me really uh, beyond a certain degree. When people say things, and I know, listen, if you knew what I knew, you'd fight me for the for what we have. No. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, Shaykh. You too, my brother. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always Allah. keep us all on a straight path. May Allah protect all those who are doing the good work. May Allah protect the Ummah. Amen. Amen. Amen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. When are you going to visit us in Australia? Inshallah soon, who knows? Uh, whenever Allah brings us, maybe Kamala towards Sheikh. the end of the year, Inshallah. We'd love to see you, Inshallah. Barakallah, Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah It's very late at the moment, we're in the UK, light yeah. upon light, we had a big, big day. We're both very tired, aren't Inshallah. we? It's amazing. <laughs> Yet, yes. the da'wah never stops, Inshallah. Barakallah. Jazakallah khair, it was lovely speaking to you, and I hope that whatever we've said, Allah accept from us, Amen. and if we've made any blunders, may Allah forgive us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.